I'm the academic director of the ECPR and uh, I have the honour of uh, chairing this roundtable today which is dedicated to 40 years of European political science. Uh, what have we learned? It's a, um, a roundtable which is in celebration of the ECPR's 40th anniversary, one of uh, several uh, events. Um, it's about European political science, not necessarily specifically about the ECPR. If you want the definitive word on the ECPR, you'll find it in this uh, wonderful booklet, uh, or should I say book or pamphlet, um, written by Ken Newton and Thibaut Boncourt, which is uh, literally just off the, off the press uh, and uh, will, will be available through various outlets uh, in due course. Um, but of course, any, uh, any discussion of the last 40 years of, uh, of European political science uh, will have some bearing on the ECPR, uh, I'm sure. The questions I've posed to our panellists today are wide-ranging, and they appear in the programme. Um, but just to run through them, um, the roundtable is dedicated to discussing the progress of our discipline in the period since the ECPR's birth. Um, has political science become more mature and sophisticated in its methods and techniques? Can it now explain things which 40 years ago it would have struggled to do so? Has the discipline become more united around a common core of values, beliefs and methods? Or has it become largely fragmented and dissipated into a stream of subdisciplinary belief systems which won't and can't talk to each other? Has there developed a distinctively European political science that can be contrasted with its North American counterpart? If so, is that distinctiveness a strength or a weakness? What is the current state of our discipline and what are its prospects? What are its strengths and weaknesses? And what does the discipline need to do in order to survive and thrive as a social science in the coming period? All that in just an hour and a half. Um, the, uh, uh, the, um, the idea is to allow the, partic the roundtable participants to um, speak freely for 10 minutes or so uh, each and then we'll open it to the floor. And really, it's meant to be an open discussion in which you can pose questions, make comments um, in whatever uh, shape or form. And at the end of today, if, um, if you really haven't had enough of what you've heard, or if you're deeply unsatisfied with what you've heard, there will be a kind of repeat performance of the round table um, uh, with a different set of people, uh, which will be at the PSA's um, uh, uh, annual conference um, next uh, month. Uh, I can't say whether the participants will be better or worse. I suspect the chair will be better. It will be chaired by William Maloney, and it will figure Michael Keating, Heather Savigny, Judith Squires, and Jerry Stoker. Um, and that roundtable will be at the PSA's annual conference. That will be entitled European Political Science, Past, Present, and Future. We couldn't say 40 years because they invited us to do a panel in honour of their 60th anniversary. So we felt that it would have put their nose out of joint had we, had we done so. But to return to today, I'm delighted uh, to welcome uh, here at the round table Hans Dieter Klingerman, Ken Newton, Drew Dallerup, Jean Blondel, and Hans uh, Dalder. Um, and without uh, further ado, I'm going to ask. Uh, Ken Newton, the author of this fine work, to co-author, sorry, to start us off. Ken. Um, I just want to start actually by, can you hear me first of all? Is it working? Yep. To read you out a nice little juicy bit from the start of the history. It's a correspondence between um, Steinrocken and uh, Peter de Genosi, a name that perhaps is less well known to you, but he was in charge of the Ford Foundation uh, section, which was negotiating with the ECPR to give its, its first grant way back in 1969. This is from Peter de Genosi. Gentlemen, he says, Americans wrote like that then. Gentlemen, your document on the consortium is excellent, carefully reasoned, well-structured and clear. It was a pleasure to read. Though the acronym of the child to which you are giving birth 
is a sheer horror. And the acronym was the ECPPR, the European Consortium for the Promotion of Political Science Research. Stein Rocken wrote back, Dear Peter, thank you for your encouraging letter. Jean and I, that's Jean Blondel, Jean and I discussed your questions in detail last weekend. We shall change the acronym to the ECPR. And that's how you come to be called uh, the, the ECPR. However, um, and it goes on like that. It's a barrel of laughs and very good fun. Get one and read it. Isn't it, Thibaut? Yes, he says. My, uh, my brief is to, uh, to talk about the ECPR's contribution to European political science. And it seems to me that in order to understand its contribution, you have to understand what political science was like in Europe in 1970, when the ECPR was founded, or at least by 1980, when it was up and running. <coughs> and the answer is, I think that there was precious little. It's very difficult for us now uh, to imagine what an empty space it was, what a vacuum it was for most people. Richard Rose, writing about the intellectual development and deficiencies that characterise much, though not all, of the discipline in the 1950s and 1960s, quote, in the decade after the Second World War, there were few universities in Europe, and social science had not yet become a separate field of study. Professors were satisfied to teach and write within a framework of history, law, institutions, and administration, with little regard to uh, comparisons with other countries. There was, in other words, at that time, not a lot that we, we would call political science now. There was constitutional public law, there was history, including, very importantly, history of international relations, public administration, and bits and pieces of other things. Uh, Ian Budge uh, was another who arrived on the European political science scene in the 1960s, fresh from a PhD in Yale with Robert Dahl, and he says, well, there was no political science. This is in an interview I did with him uh, in order to write the history. He said, there was no European political science in the 1960s because European political scientists never saw anything of each other and didn't know about each other. A few met in American universities, Harvard, Michigan, but there were very few, very few personal contacts and they were, for the most part, among a small circle of what Jean would call oligarchs, elites, a few lucky people, oligarchs and elites. Little contact in West, across Western Europe as a whole, no journals, little research, virtually no conferences, no collaboration in comparative research, no summer schools, little professional training, believe me, I know about the absence of uh, professional training in my own case. Um, I don't think my doctoral supervisor read a word I ever wrote. There's probably a very good reason for that, but um, <laughs> that's a different matter. Uh, there were just a few isolated contacts. The greatest, I'm continuing to, uh, to quote uh, Ian, the greatest tribute to the success of the ECPR in 1982 was that its members had mostly forgotten what political science in Europe was like before its establishment. Indeed, many younger colleagues have no experience of the discipline without the ECPR. What we take for granted in the shape of regular information about research in other European countries, frequent opportunities to meet colleagues, discuss future developments, to, uh, to get up to speed with new methodological and substantive, subst substantive training in European summer schools, much of that didn't exist. Joint programmes of research, a host of other opportunities that just did not exist. So what I'm going to do is talk about the institutional development, not the theoretical substantive development, but the institutional development of European political science. And by that I mean the whole of Europe, not 
individual countries. European, Europe conceived as a single continent. There were, of course, at the time, some, not many, but some national associations. But they were few and far between. There were very few journals. I guess, counting them up at the time, there were not more than half a dozen political science journals in 19, uh, the 1970. And they were divided by very deep linguistic and national boundaries. Let's take a particular example of, of a national association that was not particularly backward by European standards of the day. That's the Political Studies Association in Britain in the 50s and the 60s. Now, of course, there were a few outstanding individual writers, and there had been for several centuries before that. Uh, if we go back to Hobbes and Locke, of course there were political scientists, people who were writing stuff that we read now. But um, Brian Barry, in uh, 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 an account of British political science in the 50s and the 60s, characterizes it as a multiplicity of unrelated into the intellectual endeavors uh, with no uh, um, few methods of its own. They'd stolen most of it from history or law, um, a bit from psychology, a bit from economics. Most university teachers, in, he says, in political science were not trained in the subject, either at undergraduate or graduate level. A lot of them were modern historians. We wouldn't recognize them as political scientists at all, which is not to say they were bad modern historians, or it's not to say that, bad, that good modern history isn't good political science and vice versa. But they had no training, or little training, um, and uh, there was no sense of a cumulative or systematic discipline. Uh, Jack Hayward, another historian of the British profession, uh, very acerbic and critical, says that uh, political scientists, he actually calls that, he, won't, won't, he refuses to call them political scientists, he says they were politicists. Um, these politicists relied largely on an inductive modelling th muddling through. Oh, it's muddling through, that's a Freudian slip. <laughs> I hadn't thought about that, yes, but it was a muddling through that provided some hindsight, a little insight, and almost no foresight. I, lo I love that line. Uh, Ivor Crew uh, observes uh, the thinness and numbers of activities of, of British political science at the time. An underlying lack of confidence, a gentle muddle, the cultivated casualness of approach, all showing a lack of confidence in the discipline as a whole. So the scene was pretty empty uh, at the time. What did, what, what has the ECPR done for us in Monty Python's? You know, what, what has the ECPR done for us? Well, not very much. Um, except, well, it did nurture new generations of political science, I'll give it that. Nothing else. Well, maybe it created a European community of scholars. Yes, I'll give it that too. Um, but nothing else. Um, perhaps it developed a framework for comparative research, an institutional framework for comparative research, which took off in a big way in the 70s. Yes, that's true. And then there's another thing which I suppose you have to give the ECPR, which is something that usually goes under the radar. We don't even notice it, we don't think about it. But how much more professional we are now. There are advantages and disadvantages to that, but we're much more professional than we were, both in outlook and practice. We're much more universalistic, egalitarian. Let me just go through those very, very quickly. Bringing on the next generation of political scientists. That was, I think, one of the first prime objectives of the founders of the ECPR in 1969. It was one of that five uh, things they wanted to do, which they laid out for Peter Giudinosi and the Ford Foundation. And the first thing was the summer school, of course. <coughs> and the ECPR saved the summer school. The second year of the summer school, they had no money. And the ECPR, through its Ford Foundation grant, which, by the way, was extremely generous, 
there is in the, um, the history, I've attempted to uh, recalculate the um, Ford Foundation grant in modern, uh, modern money terms, and it was a lot of money. The Americans in those years were extremely generous. So the ECPR saved the summer school, built it up, multiplied it, the Essex summer school, then the French summer school, first in Grenoble, then in Lille, and now the uh, ECPR's own method summer school in Ljubljana. Very, very important. It's difficult to underestimate the effects of the summer school. I don't know how many people here have been to the summer school, or how many people say, oh, I met you at the summer school, that was 1960, uh, 1970, whatever it was, and so on. I mean, their successive generations of young scholars have been trained in methods and analysis. It helped a fresh wave of young scholars to talk to each other, to make contacts with each other, that kind of latent function of socialization. And more than anything else, the summer school almost failed completely because uh, um, partners in the first year decided that summer schools, there would be no demand for them, nobody would be interested in going to them. And in any case, all that mathematical stuff, modeling and, and, and data analysis, Americans could do that, but Europeans couldn't do it. So the two prime partners in the summer school in the early years withdrew on the grounds that it was a dead end. And the ECPR saved it. Not only saved it, but then, of course, multiplied the number of summer schools vastly. It took a long time. There weren't many summer schools other than the Essex and Lille summer schools for a long time, but more recently they've increased in number. So the first thing is uh, it's trained new generations of political science. In the old Marxist terms, shows you how old I am, they've been reproducing the system. And in modern jargon, there's a second function, which is it's created a public space. Well, that's almost outdated uh, uh, jargon now, public space. A public professional space, establishing workshops, producing journals. There was no, there was no I suspect that the European Journal of Political Research is the first international journal in the world. There were national journals, Canada, America, the Dutch, the uh, Nordic, uh, Finnish. There were national journals. I don't think there was any international journal. Now, they're all international, of course, they have to be. But I think the EJPR was the first international journal. Before, as I said, they were they tended to be isolated by language and national boundaries. Then, of course, there was a whole load of other publishing ventures. There are now three journals, three ECPR journals, and there are five ECPR book series. Count them, five of them. Two of them, I think they're perhaps, perhaps now one, two of them in the ECPR's own press. And, of course, the huge... Uh, weight of activity has been concentrated on Europe, but most recently the ECPR has been at the forefront of attempts to construct a global professional uh, uh, public space, that is to reach out and make links with APSA, with uh, the International Political Science Association, um, with uh, the ISA and so on. So the second thing, it, it has created a community where we can meet in the same room and talk about the same sorts of things, even if we are fragmented in various other ways. At least we can and do talk to each other. Third, promoted research. Research has taken off in Europe. Comparative research has taken off in Europe um, largely through the ECPR. Not only has it organised uh, this joint sessions where you can talk about research, it's had its research sessions, it's kicked and prodded and prompted and twisted the arms of foundations to give money. Jean has been a prime leader in all of this to get them to think about comparative research. It was very difficult to talk, think about comparative research in 1970, simply because there was very, very little money for, there was money for national research, but not comparative 
cross-national research, and it was quite an uphill struggle to persuade some of the foundations to think in those terms. So the third one, moving on very quickly, these two things which I think are, we take for granted now, we don't think about it, but I think are very important. Professionalism and equality. Professionalism about the way in which we do our research, the way in which we communicate it, the thoroughly professional way that we now meet in the joint sessions. People produce their papers in advance, uh, their quality stuff, it's not stuff written on the back of an envelope. There was time when that happened. And remember that the joint sessions are thoroughly egalitarian. That's one reason why some people, some of the old grey-head oligarchs, don't like them. I've heard this story. They do not like them because young scholars come along and say, I think you've got this wrong. You're using the wrong method. Don't you know about this latest thing? There is a, an argument, I think, which I find appealing, which is that, method, that those who do comparative empirical work are far more egalitarian in their approach because the young Turks know all about the most recent methods and lecture the old grey heads about how primitive they are. And when it comes to political theory, perhaps it's the old grey heads who require that young people sit at their feet and get lectured at. Well, I know I'm an old grey head. Uh, I don't want you to sit at my feet any longer. Um, and I'm um, not going to uh, go on any longer, except to make one short point. Of course, the founders of the ECPR were very lucky in being in the right place at the right time. Uh, undoubtedly true. For all kinds of political, economic uh, reasons, it was, the time was right. But you know we can overestimate the importance of luck. I have a friend who tells me, he says, isn't it funny, he says, the harder I work, the luckier I seem to get. And I must say, Jean and Hans were very lucky indeed. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Ken. And now Hans Delger, I think, is going to correct some of Ken's misapprehensions. <laughs> correct. I shall start with an old English political scientist in saying that the state of political science in and on Europe was not so solitary, poor, nasty, and brutish in the 1950s and 1960s, as uh, Ken Newton seems to suggest. And I have a few arguments for that. In the first place, if it had been so, how come that the, the arrival of so many Europeans during the 1930s and early 40s in the American academic community had such an influence that indeed their parochialism uh, was uh, broken up uh, by uh, that particular approach, point one. The second point I have is that even after 1945, youngsters like myself and Jean Blondel, who were about 17 when the war was over and had lived under occupations, uh, profited from the opening up of frontiers. But that was 45, that was 25 years before 1970. And we both went to Britain and therefore, uh, already, we were comparatists, partly because of our own reaction, uh, even though it was only paired comparisons uh, in the Rockan uh, uh, wording. Now, I also think that long before the establishment, uh, there had been already a drastic reorientation away from mere legalistic, philosophic and historical approaches, as Ken suggested. Um, Notably, the rise of totalitarianism uh, caused people to turn towards psychological, to sociological explanations, uh, and uh, it led them to formulate important hypotheses or theories or insights uh, into the political science profession, which make it a, a very different kind of social science, quite apart from the fact that there was something like Sozialwissenschaften uh, in long before uh, uh, Newton declared that it didn't exist uh, much before the ECPR. But it also uh, led people to f uh, begin 
both diachronic and synchronic comparisons for the simple reason that Jan had to account why totalitarian uh, developments took place in some countries and not in others. Uh, and uh, alone that question forced people to look into different societies to, to account for that particular fact. And also after 45, after all, we were trying to account for the persistence of authoritarian regimes in Spain and, and in Southern Europe, uh, to some extent in South America uh, as well. So I don't think that I would recognize myself that every political scientist was only a country specialist. And I think it would also be wrong to underestimate the uh, organizational efforts of a host of organizations uh, uh, which were different uh, and possibly not so in, important in the longer run, but uh, both the UNESCO initiatives to, in uh, helping to establish the International Political Science Association and the International Sociological Association and the International Social Science Research Council, uh, and in turn fathering uh, the Committee on Comparative Political Sociology, uh, predated the ECPR by at least 10 years, or if not 20 years in certain cases, uh, and therefore, um, uh, I think that if you look at the output, uh, which there already was, uh, of studies of a comparative nature, I think there's a great deal more than in the picture of Newton. Uh, and I think he quotes wrongly the people who were younger and didn't know when they came over to England, like uh, in the case of Rose or in the case of Butch, who was just, of course, had been to the Mecca of uh, to Yale. but. Uh, if they had known a little more German and maybe even a little more French, uh, then uh, I think there would have been uh, a great deal more than they actually uh, than they suggested. And then I would finally say, just in defense, so to say, of European scholarship, uh, that um, bodies like OECD uh, began to foster comparative studies of policy, uh, comparative policy studies uh, in a uh, very deliberate international climate. And from that also other approaches, like uh, new, the sort of new, new corporatism, which was not unrelated to the, uh, the rise of Marxism, which also had sometimes a rather comparative nature, um, even though they know that knew the answers possibly already. Uh, all that, uh, as, uh, to me, uh, suggests that there was a great deal more uh, before the ECPR actually started, and the fact that there was a bit more may have helped uh, some people to move towards such a thing as ECPR. Now the second proposition that I have was that one should pay rather more attention to the effect of the increased American-European relationship. And I have the following points on that. In the first place, uh, after all, a large number of European youngsters of my generation were brought over due to generosity of the American uh, world uh, and, uh, by foundations, fellowships, uh, various fellowships, uh, very, uh, various foundations and also the Fulbright program to the United States. And at the same time also a large number of Americans for the first time came to Europe and helped uh, to ask questions about European countries and also fostered, I think, uh, to some degree a comparative climate. Now the second thing uh, is that um, most of these youngsters uh, had a sort of similar reaction to the uh, American scene. They were obviously uh, made enthusiastic by the wealth of possibilities, the optimistic research climates, the new techniques, all kinds of theories, etc. But they also found uh, that somehow many of the propositions were not quite, did not quite fit their own particular country. And therefore they wanted to do two things. First, to prove that their own country uh, ought to be brought onto the European map, which means single country studies on the European map, which means available for others. And uh, at the same time, um, uh, suggesting uh, different approaches uh, being necessary as corrections to what they felt was possibly bias in American uh, approaches towards comparative. Then uh, further on, on the basis of my own experience, I would simply say how much comparative research there actually was, which was largely indeed financed uh, originally by Americans, but which were important projects. Uh, I have a long list uh, somewhere in, uh, 
in the version, but I'm thinking of the influence of the American Committee on Comparative Politics, which gave us the Yola Palambara and Wiener volume on political parties, the political oppositions project by uh, Robert, edited by Robert Dow. I'm thinking of the, um, uh, the series of studies uh, under the aegis of the uh, Committee on Political Sociology, which were very wide-ranging ones, and which Lipston Rockham uh, headed this, but were others drawn in as well. And I'm thinking of the follow-up of, uh, 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 of the uh, Elman Verba study on Soviet culture in the seven nation state uh, participation research, which was in the field actually when the ECPR uh, was established in that particular year. Now, of all these f f f ventures, uh, I would suggest, uh, oh, I, sorry, I, I'm jumping my own argument. Um, the most important influence was obviously electoral studies, uh, which in various ways were imitated in different European countries, but in um, which the Michigan model eventually became uh, the leading uh, and dominant partner. And that was not unimportant because there wouldn't have been a summer school at Essex were it not for the example uh, of the Ann Arbor Summer School. And secondly, uh, I think if it weren't for the fact that Americans have moved out so much to do comparative survey research with uh, European scholars, there wouldn't have been Warren Miller as the chief consultant uh, to, to the Ford Foundation, helping to persuade the Ford Foundation to begin to look into the possibility and need uh, of supporting a, a European venture. And I think that should uh, not be forgotten because uh, it was the Ford Foundation, the Yonossi, which of course has been acknowledged by, by Ken, who after all uh, went at one time on a reconnaissance trip and brought eventually uh, in consultation with Stein Rockan and Jean Blondel, the eight uh, founders, uh, uh, together, uh, so that uh, not only there was finance, but there also was a beginnings of departmental organizations. Now, the third point that I would like to make is that the ECPR in the beginning did face a number of vital choices, right or wrong. In the first place, there was no question that the original idea was somewhat that uh, one should salvage even uh, because it coincided with the threat uh, of the student un unrest. One should salvage at least some precious research centers. And uh, uh, presumably the, the eight original centers uh, served for the, could serve for that purpose. Uh, that's why it was a reconnaissance strip, so to say. But the founders could have reserved the money for themselves and have had comparative research just between eight centers. Technically, that was not excluded by the, by the document. It never was envisaged when we started out that it would be so large as it is. But the important thing is that they did not uh, reserve the money just to those eight centers, but they, right from the beginning, began to build further context and, indeed, uh, therefore, did not reserve uh, this to uh, a few, just a few uh, centers, even though some of them were very important. Now, for all the American support uh, that we enjoyed, we answered that we would not have Americans as members, because the eager young Americans uh, who were already able to do all the great things uh, in methods, etc., would simply overrun the American scene in search of a publications list, and one should rather not have that. And one should also not have Eastern Europeans uh, who are under, uh, not under free control and therefore became a Western European uh, organization. Now, so much has changed now because the world has changed, but we should realize that it became, in a sense, under American instigation with American money, uh, largely a possibility to, uh, to do what we did in an increasing, rapidly increasing uh, group of, pe uh, of people. Now, uh, there was also, and that was not an easy thing to put one's finger on, that there was some tension amongst the original eight on the question whether uh, political science meant really the behavioral approach, yes or no, or whether it sh should remain general. And that tension has existed, but I remember at one time that Stein Rockan, for instance, uh, with all his experience and great learning, uh, wanted to, to organize a, a summer school which was on a substantive project. And that led to a great debate, and eventually the ECPR did not underwrite the finance of that Rockham summer school, 
with Rockland having many other organizational activities, then had to get somewhere else. Uh, and there is a potential trace in some of the arguments that these methods are professional methods, it's quantitative methods, uh, even though I must say that right from the beginning, fortunately, we have not followed that path exclusively. The very fact that there was an international relations group later, but it was early on the same Brian Berry uh, asked to do a political theory uh, field, uh, etc. And it, if you look at the programs of the workshop uh, as they uh, de uh, de developed, they were not only sort of the modern political science kind of subjects. But it, that was a, nevertheless a choice which was important uh, and which may have led to tension even for a longer period. Then we did decide, of course, that English would be the only language. And I think that was probably inevitable and right, but it had the problem that it, in a sense, uh, lasted until a very long time that uh, the Latin part of Europe was fully integrated. And France, of course, never was, uh, even though it helped some Frenchmen to, to begin and to, begin to be English speakers. Now, just on uh, as a few last points, um, I think uh, that, uh, I, I, in a sense, I would have liked uh, to, to return to something which I said uh, as an outgoing chairman in 1979, the second chairman uh, of the after following St. Rockham. And I had some fears which then one. One was that uh, the uh, contact with the United States would actually mean that there was a lot of bilateralism and very little multilateralism in Europe. That I think the ECPR has really uh, corrected and that is I think a very important uh, element. Secondly, um, um, I think that um, I made the point that large countries tended to be less open than small countries and I warned that small countries would have larger communities and therefore also might turn to some extent into parochial uh, countries getting more self uh, looking towards their own particular world. Now, that has happened to some extent, but paradoxically, uh, the, uh, the dominance of the English language has led to some degree to lose, uh, to, to, to make countries lose the uh, role of political scientists in their own societies and their own countries. It's paradoxical that some of the good national journals, which also have a function, uh, even though they were not in English, have been supplanted because it is better to write an English language article and you get higher points and get better finance than to write an important article for your own society. Um, that is something which I don't think has been solved and cannot be solved by the CPR. Now, uh, I think uh, I have one or two more points, but I think you'll probably stop. <laughs> okay. Now, Hans Dieter Klinger. Well, <clears throat> we have all these great questions and uh, 10 minutes time. So we face uh, a problem of selection. And I want uh, not so much, uh, although I would love to do it too, uh, indulge in good old memories because uh, <clears throat> I have uh, lived through all these periods myself and uh, have my own observations. Uh, I would uh, uh, like to spend my 10 minutes mostly on uh, uh, trying to uh, uh, portray the ECPR as one organization among uh, a lot of others uh, trying to organize integration and collaboration uh, in the social sciences and the humanities. Uh, now, to make it crystal clear, you know, uh, uh, I think that uh, without the ECPR as the core engine, uh, uh, our profession and political science research would not be where it is today. That is crystal clear, and in that respect, I side with Ken Newton. The ECPR has transformed uh, the public sphere for the discourse at a European level. And I give it to Hans 
that uh, <coughs> before the ECPR uh, appeared, there was, of course, political science in Europe. But it was mainly centered to the nation state and uh, uh, the cooperation and collaboration was not very expressed. And there is, of course, a problem of numbers. When I started to study political science in Germany, we had 29 chairs. Now today, and I don't want to go into these histories, but today, if we talk about Europe, and it must be said that Europe is now uh, also uh, encompassing the Central and Eastern European countries, we talk about numbers like about 700 uh, organizational units which carry political science research. We talk about 10,000 academic staff, not included uh, PhD students, and we talk about at least 300,000 uh, political science students take uh, at least some courses in political science. So, <clears throat> If we try to compare, we have to also take into account the size and what has always been an advantage of the Americans was that they were, had more people and a, a bigger competition and a, a greater chance for investment and for differentiation. Now, I think we have reached that stage in Europe too. However, numbers don't need quality at the same time. This needs time and to generate quality and differentiation among different places where research and teaching is taking place uh, takes time. I have uh, uh, in preparation for today uh, 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 try to look at Bob Goodin's uh, 10 plus 1 volumes uh, of the Oxford handbooks and uh, uh, just to give you a, a, a little a taste uh, on uh, the weight uh, of Europe uh, and uh, the United States and the rest of the world I have uh, calculated the number of authors uh, <coughs> coming from the US, from Europe, and from other parts of the world, basically meaning Australia and Canada. Uh, <coughs> and uh, you have uh, proportions of Americans uh, writing these uh, uh, key uh, articles uh, in political methodology. You have 88% American authors. Uh, in political economy, I mean, uh, 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 something which I always claimed as a European kind of tradition. You have 82% of the authors. You have 87% in comparative politics. And uh, to uh, be a little brighter, political theory, uh, you only have 50% Americans, 29% Europeans. In uh, public policy, you have 51% Europeans, 40%. Uh, 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 and uh, I, the, 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 the fact of the matter is that uh, if you have a proportion here of authors overall of 75% and 20% uh, 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 Europeans, then you get uh, the weights right. You know, it is not that uh, the editors of these handbooks have all been Americans and favoring their American uh, colleagues. Rather, the Americans have developed over, over the hundreds of years excellent institutions. And if you read where they come from, it is Princeton, Harvard, Yale, etc. Name them. And this is what we are facing in Europe. This kind of uh, elite institutions need to be developed. And uh, I, I hope that uh, uh, the ECPR uh, is uh, one mechanism uh, uh, to, uh, to reach that uh, stage. If uh, you want to rely on Bob Goodin's uh, uh, handbooks, then 
in a nutshell, uh, in political theory, what you have is not just coexistence, but active collaboration between uh, 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 people uh, like uh, uh, Anne uh, Phillips, uh, John Dreisack, and others, but very different approaches, post-structuralist and critical theory, etc. It is no longer divided tables. It is rather more cooperation. And in uh, political methodology, uh, you again observe, you know, I, on the one hand, new technologies which, uh, uh, or statistical techniques which allow you to include context with the multi-level analysis uh, uh, programs. Uh, <clears throat> but also what you see uh, is a, an, a rapid increase in causal models. And with this rapid increase in causal models, what you basically need is uh, uh, to, uh, to have people working qualitatively so to make a story about the mechanisms which underlie the causal structure. So what you have is, uh, is differentiation, but also uh, co cooperation, both in theory and methods. And uh, as we all know, theory and methods, that makes uh, for, for a science. Uh, <coughs> what I have said in the beginning, uh, I want to give you some information about, is the environment in which uh, the ECPR operates organizationally. Uh, in another uh, uh, analysis, I have uh, looked at how many uh, organizations are there in Europe, uh, over and above the ECPR, uh, 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 trying to organize a discourse. And I've counted 50. I don't want to read them to you, but uh, among them are such uh, organizations like uh, the Trans-European Policy Studies Association, etc. So the specialties are ganging up, organizing, uh, and having a, a, a discourse. And uh, <coughs> uh, what you also see uh, is that research is, of course, dependent on resources. And uh, if uh, you look at the uh, funding of comparative uh, research, uh, of course you have your national science foundations, but uh, you also have, and we have the ESF, the European Science Foundation, but they are very limited. What comes as a real funding giant is the European Commission or the, the European Union. The fourth framework program has allocated 13 million EQ at that time for the uh, social sciences and the humanities. The seventh framework program, and under which we are now operating, allocates 263 million euros uh, to uh, social sciences and the humanities. This is a factor of 50 in an increase from 1997 uh, 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 to 2007, in 10 years. This leaves an impact, and I, uh, I give you some figures. Uh, I've looked at the European Commission's reports on uh, the projects they have funded uh, in uh, <coughs> uh, so socioeconomic sciences and humanities and social sciences and humanities. And uh, <coughs> what you see here is that 73 countries are involved, uh, that is where the coordinators and the partners of these projects come from. What you have in these 267 projects they have funded, you have 1,079 research organizations in Europe involved. And of these uh, 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 organizations, only 43% come from universities and 1% from the academics. So 56% of the organizations which cooperate in the social sciences and humanities program funded by the European Commission uh, it comes from outside the academia. And we have uh, to take that into account. And we see, if you look at the number of researchers coming from particular uh, institutions uh, cooperating in these endeavors, you find uh, the London School of Economics, uh, the University of Amsterdam, 
the University of Ljubljana, Central European University, these are on top. They have uh, numbers of researchers involved in these projects, which uh, are, are highest. Uh, if you... Uh, <coughs> If you turn from this uh, look and counting of uh, organizational units supporting uh, research in these framework programs to the researchers. Now, most researchers, uh, uh, that is 63%, come from universities. So the universities and the academies as the larger bodies uh, uh, are good for involving more researchers and uh, the others the, the commercial and non-profit organizations, which are doing pretty good uh, research as well. Uh, they send uh, 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 less people there. But what I wanted uh, to emphasize here is <coughs> that we, we must uh, uh, not fall in the trap uh, 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 to think that uh, the ECPR is the only organization in this world who tries uh, to sponsor and uh, uh, tries uh, to uh, uh, support the cooperative, integrative tendencies and uh, <coughs> research. I, I stop here. Thank you, Hans-Dieter. And now Drew Dutter. Thank you. Um, I'll start by uh, taking you back to 1977 when I went to my first international conference in uh, Berlin, in Berlin. Uh, I had never been to an international conference before outside uh, the Scandinavian countries and I was nervous, uh, I was late, it's not good. Um, but it was also the first uh, workshop uh, on uh, women politics, as it was called this, that time. And it was chaired by uh, the Finnish uh, Elina Havimanila and Helga Hernes from Norway, who later became a deputy foreign minister, which you might know. Uh, I have heard that there was some discussion about whether to have a workshop on women politics within the ECPR. Uh, I don't know who we're against because my colleague in the University of Stockholm, Olaf Ruin, says that he was for, he supported it. I'm sure he did. But I also know that any success have many founding fathers when it has, has become a success and never has it in the start. At any rate, uh, I always also know, maybe that could be put into the history here, that after this first workshop, which has been very successful for many of us, some people said uh, that now we have had the workshop on women and we don't need any more. Um, and this is what is so fantastic to, to be here and talk about this, that uh, being, uh, being at the very first workshop and then seeing the, the, the total development of this new field uh, as an international discipline, which now has its uh, journals, gender and politics, international feminist journal of politics, many of them, women uh, policy and uh, politics, lots of PhDs, uh, dissertations uh, being written, lots of uh, conferences, now it's not women politics, now it's gender and politics. And, and last year, in January 2009, there was this big Called a conference in Belfast called the first European conference uh, on gender and politics, in which there were uh, more than 200 scholars, and most of them presenting papers. Unfortunately, I had the flu, but uh, I would have loved very much to see this because coming from a situation where we have very, very few in the field, uh, to to this fantastic development of a new international discipline, I think the ECPR has been instrumental for that. Uh, and I think, I, I didn't have any reason to be so, so nervous about this uh, uh, first workshop because in fact it was a very friendly atmosphere. And I agree with what uh, Kendis write, writes, that there's something very egalitarian about the workshop structure. I mean, it doesn't have the, 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 the temperature, or the hot temperature of the APSAC, which of course we all love also, 
but it is it's extremely good because you stay in the same room with the same people for several days and everybody discusses the papers. It's a very good, it's a very good format and I really love that format. Uh, and you get contact, contact for life, for, for your own life, for your whole life when you start, uh, in, when you are in those workshops. Uh, I would also argue that those workshops have been very instrumental for new fields to develop. As I said many times, when you start a new field, you are alone, maybe one or two in your own institute, and you need an international uh, cooperation to do things. Uh, certainly, I, I, I wasn't taught gender studies at the University of Aarhus in Denmark, where I, was, I graduated. Uh, the, the, the term women or gender or family was never mentioned. There were no women teachers, there were no textbooks in which women or gender there was kind of natural category out there. Uh, I remember we were trying to, we challenged our, our uh, teachers when they said that two very important theories here. One theory is that uh, the fundamental political preferences are being developed during your childhood or early uh, adolescence. That's one theory. Another theory, women follow the political preferences of their husbands. We said, aren't they conflicting the two of them? Well, the only way you don't see them as conflicting, because how can, what about women's preferences that are they not formed in the childhood? Uh, this is of course because the man was the norm of the series, and the teachers didn't even see that there was a conflict. Uh, uh, last year in Chile, at the IPSA meeting, we were celebrating the 30 years of the IPSA uh, Research Council, uh, sorry, it's called uh, 19 Research Committee on Sexuals and Politics was the name. Now it's called Gender and Politics, of course. And that has also been very instrumental to build uh, commu communication, cooperation between researchers. And I think that ever since, I haven't really looked through it, Ken, but ever since 1997, there's always been a, a workshop with some gender perspective in it. Uh, but also very important that you now have papers on the gender perspectives in all time, in all workshops, everywhere. And I think that is very, uh, very interesting. Uh, Ken, uh, I think this is an excellent paper you wrote. Of course, I also have to argue a little bit against you when you say that the first political scientists were narrow, or parochial, and heav heavily descriptive. Uh, and you also said, uh, what did you say? European political scientists didn't know each other. I, I think we have a small state coalition here because we knew about what happened in the United States uh, and we knew about what happened in the United Kingdom, but you didn't know about the rest of us, right? Uh, so, and I think when I, look, I, uh, when I was thinking about this uh, speech here, I was looking at the first textbook uh, my professor, Eric Asmussen, which you would never know about wrote because he was a historian because of course the first teachers in political science were not political scientists, I mean the definition. He was a historian. And what did he do? When he, he wrote, you know, Eastern every he wrote all the, the political science literature in Britain and in the United States and in Germany and France uh, France at that time and he put it into this book. It was not a parochial book. There was something about Denmark and, and the Nordic countries too, but it was not parochial at all. And we as a student, we had to read German French, English, of course, and then all the, the, the Scandinavian country uh, languages. Uh, my first economic books was in, in German, right? Today, my students would only read English. Uh, I can't even make uh, my Swedish students, where I am now, at the University of Stockholm, I can't even make them read Danish or Norwegian, right? Not to speak about French and German. So I think there was something very interesting about those, the first, the first, first professors here who came from, how did they get their inspiration? David Easton was the, the big one for us, when I remember that. Also, I think when we talk about political theory, uh, it was very, very uh, competent. It was very good teaching in political theory. It was nothing uh, uh, pure descriptive about that. So, uh, there, this, uh, there's a couple of uh, questions here with a very, i uh, try to answer some of them. Uh, have uh, political science fragmented into political sub-disciplines that don't talk to each other? Uh, yes, the first, yes. The second, no. 
uh, and especially within my field which is gender and politics, I think there's a lot of discussion across uh, various uh, uh, methodological uh, perspectives, various approaches, uh, even various uh, themes. Uh, and when you look at the, the program for the workshop here, well, some of the, some of the workshops are about a specific area. Other workshops are around a, a, a concept like government, governance. Uh, and some of them are about a perspective, like a gender perspective. Uh, and I think it's very interesting to see how this has really developed. Uh, I think that we all, in a way, word fetishists, aren't we? We like new concepts. Um, I think we have also to, rea to realize that many of the new ideas come, of course, from the younger people. And that's also why ECPR has been very important. Uh, the discursive uh, change or turn, even the linguistic turn, also in political science, have of course come by the younger people who do not get support from their supervisors because you are in a dilemma, dilemma that you want to do something new and therefore you have to challenge your supervisor and at the same time this is your supervisor. And I think here the ECPR has been very good to, 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 to be common uh, ground for, for young people to meet and to discuss with each other. Then there was a the question, have we increased the standard of political science and do we know more now and can we explain more than we could, you know, I don't know, 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago? That was a very challenging question. That was your, your question, right? Um, I don't think so. I think uh, we go in waves around concepts, about themes, about uh, methods. Uh, there are new generations with uh, new ways of looking at things. I, I would, couldn't put it on a line that we're just getting smarter and smarter. I think we are, we are working in wave, waves around themes and, and concepts and perspectives. And, and I'm sure that 10 years from now, nobody is talking about governance, right? There will be no workshops on governance 10 years from now, uh, as it was not 10 years earlier. So these things come and, and go, and, and that is fine with me, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, are we good at predictions uh, in political science? I think we all, all always wanted, didn't we, to be able to make generalizations, to be smarter than the historians. We say they, use with, they work with the particular and we work with the generalizations, right? Have we been successful in our predictions? Well, probably not. Uh, I remember all the discussions we had before uh, the changes, before the event, before 1889, there was nobody who predicted what would happen. Uh, nobody, really. Uh, Oh, Karl Deutsch has an article in 53 that the country would, that Russia would succumb in 40 years. Yeah. Oh, that's great. That's great. <laughs> I, lo I, lo I really love that. Uh, and and I, I think, of course, we have to be self-critical also because in some ways, sometimes when we work on these predictions and things, we are coming too close to political journalism. And I guess that we all know the, the risk. Uh, we get a journalist in the phone who wants us to, to say something very banal about if this, uh, this government does this, what would, how would that influence the, the voters? And, and sometimes we really go along and, and make these kind of small, small scale predictions. Uh, let me use uh, my last comments. And uh, I have to comment on, on the question of the European Commission. Uh, and all the research money coming out of the European Commission. I'm myself involved in a large project. We have 4 million euros, so it's a lot of money, 15 universities. It is a lot of bureaucracy. And it's, we use one third of all our energy to write reports to, to, to bureaucrats, bureaucrats sitting in, in Brussels who put that in the drawer. Uh, it's, it, of course, inspiring, but I would like to the ECPR to be instrumental to getting research money out of the bureaucrats uh, group in Brussels and get it into free research money again. And let us get rid of these writing reports to, to, to young bureaucrats who have not, no idea about what we are doing and what this, this topic is about. I think we have to get it out 
uh, all those monies from the European Commission into free research money. I don't know where the King Sound Sound Foundation, whatever. My last comment. This is about the European. Has there developed a distinctive European political science that can be contrasted with its North American counterpart? I, I think this is an uninteresting question. I really don't care. I think there are so much interaction now. We've all been in the United States and people live everywhere and, and we read each other stuff and we, we mail all over the world. And in fact, I'm not really th uh, sure I think it's important. Of course, the ECBR has been very important for the Euro developing European political science, but today I see myself as a political scientist in a global world. And I think that, that many of my colleagues and the people I read, they are now in South Africa, they are in Latin America, they are in India, they are in Japan, uh, they are of course also in, 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 in Germany, in France, uh, whatever. Uh, but to me, political science today is and should be uh, a global science. Not, so I'm not so interested in whether we are different from the Americans. I think this is an old discussion and I'm not interested in that one. Thank you. Thank you, Jude. And finally, uh, Jean Blondet. Thank you. Uh, I like very much what the last speaker said. Uh, and I liked her relative pessimism at some points, uh, except the very last bit, in which she showed a sort of fantastic optimism that I don't share at all, in terms of the extent to which the profession is global or... Uh, let's sort of look at the case of Europe. It's all very nice saying that the ECPR has, and I agree that the ECPR has done a lot of things and brought people together, etc. But the fact of the matter is there are enormous differences, enormous, between various countries, and I don't want to name them, but I have been sharing part of these, of two of these countries, and the differences are such that the chasm is almost as great as it was. 30 or 40 years ago. There is no doubt that Britain has developed political science to an extent that almost no other country in Western Europe has done. And uh, I think uh, this is something that we ought to think about. And when the previous speaker said that it didn't matter, or it is an uninteresting question to say whether the, uh, Europe, Europe has developed a European uh, aspect versus America, I don't think the problem is that. The problem is that uh, we are still back to the old stupidity of Easton saying about Bryce that we don't need facts. The fact of the matter is that neither in Europe nor in these other parts of the world do we really have a sort of sense of what is going on. And uh, I think comparative politics is very difficult. Uh, and I think people have uh, all sorts of reasons to not do comparative politics. And to begin with, as a graduate student, doing a proper comparative politics analysis is something which is, uh, uh, I don't know, I mean, it's, uh, it's almost absurd. Because from the moment that you really want to try to get data on two or three countries, you get into enormous difficulties of one kind or another. It's much easier to be a sociologist or an economist where you get all these data which have been produced to you by the United Nations or ECD, etc., and you just churn out this data. And uh, comparative politics is, I think, still, the, uh, for me, the, the object of, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of Olympics of political science, because you are really obliged to find out a lot of things and uh, that you, unless you do it yourself, you aren't going to find out at all. And uh, I'm, I think it is a, a great sadness, in my opinion, that uh, we don't sufficiently see the problems which are posed by the analysis or the discovery of data and the further analysis of this data uh, afterwards. So that uh, I think uh, 
Perhaps unfortunately, you may be right, but I think it is nonetheless the case that we are doing things which are in some sense distinctly European instead of being global. Because people aren't going to do things on Latin America or in Africa or on Asia unless they have somehow or other say connection with this. There is something which is missing in our uh, psyche almost, which makes us focus it's essentially on what goes on in either our country or perhaps two or three countries and maybe the United States. Now, uh, uh, let me, the, the chairman produced a long list of things which I thought was most interesting about what the uh, profession uh, is or is not like. Uh, for me, the, the question of the, being distinctly European in a somewhat negative sense of the word is something which bothers me enormously. The question of unity of the profession then bothers me to an extent which is different, uh, which is that in some sense, uh, What I would like to say is that in some sense we are too easily taken by the idea that we could do something which would unify the profession very easily. Uh, I often wonder, the comparison with economics uh, I find very interesting from this point of view. I often wonder what would be the case if economics did not have microeconomics only had begun ever as with macroeconomics and how they would handle these big corporations, the differences in the way they, they are, they behave, they, they, how they are organized, how they handle matters. Uh, we are in some sense constrained by this kind of thing because we are handling states, uh, big, big things, big rocks in this landscape that we are. And we don't really know how to do it. And uh, so uh, one side of us feels that uh, this is much too much of an Everest. So it's probably much better to remain at a sort of lower level and we sort of churn out data of one kind or another, or we put all these data in the same box, although we realize that they're on quite the same thing. Uh, how we get out of this predicament, I don't know. The solution of this predicament is not by being united, not by saying, oh, it's going to be simple, we're all going to adopt the same kind of methodology, etc. That isn't true. That isn't true because, uh, what we are talking about is human beings, which is much more complicated than any kind of uh, ideology, uh, methodology can suggest. Uh, and also because we're dealing with people who have got ideologies and we've got to accept that these ideologies exist. And p political science is probably the social science which has to put ideology in the front of, of its uh, preoccupations. It cannot not be concerned with ideology and therefore it cannot not be in some way disunited because of this uh, situation. But I won't, I'm not sure I, may, I can make myself really clear about what I think is the main predicament of political science, which is to in some ways out, outpass, go beyond uh, what would seem to be the simple uh, sort of uh, commonality of things. And at the same time, what we want to do is to uh, handle differences, handle differences as they are, for instance, in the, from, uh, you know, if you are going to look at the Middle East and compare the Middle East with uh, uh, Western Europe. We want to be able to handle these kinds of differences and in some sense, we, we, we know well that we really can't. And so I, I like it in, in a way. I like it because it gives us a sort of sense that we are sort of doing a, a kind of frontier activity. 
And I would like just my last words to be that this is it. What we have to have in our satchel, as it were, is the fact that we are in a frontier sort of uh, discipline, a discipline which is doing things which, like everybody else, we have to do, but a discipline which I think must always realize that it is above this, it is more complicated than this. It is dealing with human beings in a very, very deep manner. And quite frankly, I hope that we all realize that we are not sufficiently great ourselves as intellect to understand the complexities and the variations of human beings. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. Um, well, we've got uh, a bit of time. We can run slightly over so for some questions and, and comments. And then uh, uh, I might give the speakers one more minute each uh, to, 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 to come back. So could you raise your hand if you wish to uh, ask a question or make a comment? Actually, the acoustics in here are quite good, so you might not need the microphone. But we, perhaps we could have someone take the microphone. Who will start us off? Questions? Comments? Yeah, Daniele. Uh, you're up without. Could you stand up then? Hi, thanks. Um, I'm a big fan of ICPR. I think it's a great organization, but it's a very unbalanced organization. Where is international relations and also political theory? If we go through the workshops, we rarely see these, uh, these uh, uh, other two main fields beside uh, comparative politics. That would be my remark, but also question. Thank you, Daniel. Hey. Raise your hand if you have a question or point. Yeah, with that, please. Hi, Amy Verdun, University of Victoria, Canada. Uh, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about how um, people's work has become evaluated over time. So gone are the days where people just write something, it gets published, everybody's happy. Increasingly people are looking at, you know, EU grants want reports, but then there's the UK with its uh, research assessment exercise and lots of people in various countries complaining about multiple rankings of journals and where everything sits and is it worth writing this or that. Would you be willing to speak a little bit about what your views on love, that part of the development over 40 years? Okay. We've got time for two more questions, I think, and then uh, we have to uh, wind up within five minutes, is it? Yeah, we have five minutes. Any any other questions? Yeah, one down here, Jose. So just a question about maybe each one could say something about personally what they gain from being involved in ECPR. What is important for you in terms of the ECPR for yourself? Personally, what you gained? Yeah. You can take one more. One more. There is. Yeah, the back there, Lewis. Okay. <laughs> Maybe I can just. I can ask. Yeah. Stand up, and then we'll hear you better. Thank you. Yeah, you can hear me perfectly. Um, right. So, for all these years. We've been um, studying actors that nobody loves, talking about political elites. We've been studying processes that nobody understands. And we've been studying institutions that nobody trusts. So why are we missing the point? <laughs> Thank you, Liz. Um, OK, I'll run back now. Uh, well, in the, in the, in the, probably in the same order. Could I, literally uh, 30 seconds to a minute each. Ken, start with you. Um, 
word and how, how one minute, I don't know. Um, research evaluated is obviously a much more important uh, activity it ever was. One of the things that stri strikes me about, no, let me go back a bit. The research assessment exercise in Britain is carried out by peer group review, and it's interesting to compare how different academic disciplines across every single one in British universities, from microbiology to phantasmagorical studies to uh, whatever it is. It's interesting to compare how they rate themselves. And guess who rates themselves the highest? The economists. They did this about three months before the world economy collapsed. <laughs> and they still rank themselves very highly. Guess who ranks themselves very, very harshly in Britain? Political scientists. And we know from our experience now that the best we can ever hope for now, the best we can ever hope for, if we want to submit a, uh, uh, an article for a decent journal, is a, a revise heavily and resubmit. I don't think that's only my own experience only. It just is normal now. You just have to take the thing apart at the seams, rework it and rewrite it, sometimes in what you think and so on. I think we've become hypercritical. I mean, that's one of the, 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 my thoughts about evaluation. What's important for me, um, as, you, as you probably dis discovered from my uh, account of the ECR, it just did, it made the world a completely different place for me. Research possibilities, the publishing possibilities, uh, the ability to do um, comparative research. I don't think, in spite of what Hans said, I don't think I would have had nearly the same chances without the ECPR. Studying actors that nobody loves. Have you not heard of um, Obama, this, this uh, politician who's rather popular in America at the moment? Um, how long for? I don't know. I mean, you know, but uh, uh, that's a different matter. Um, ECPR unbalanced? Yes, in a sense it always is. Uh, it responds in, in a lot of ways to demand. But one of the things that strikes me was that, um, of course, the IR people were excluded from the ECPR right from the very start. No, they weren't. There was an IOR workshop every year for the first 10 years of the ECPR workshop, 73 uh, to, to uh, 83. There was an IOR workshop every year, and yet you can read in here how badly the IR group was treated. It's not true. Thank you. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> well, let, let me make one remark regarding quality control. <clears throat> this, uh, I think, uh, as far as it, uh, it, as it relates to institutions, and uh, the institute I have uh, been working in has uh, almost every second year an evaluation, and uh, every fourth year a really major evaluation, is uh, simply uh, due to the fact that uh, uh, academia uh, is uh, in need of legitimation. You know, the political decision makers and citizens uh, no longer hold professors in high esteem, you know. So y you, you have to have some way to legitimize spending money on uh, something which uh, nobody understands and, uh, and uh, 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 getting <coughs> Uh, 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 getting support uh, on that. Uh, so quality control uh, is developing into a commercial kind of uh, sector. Uh, what uh, was important uh, for me personally, that will be my l last remark regarding the ECPR. Uh, in uh, the 60s, uh, I, I was working in, at the University of Cologne with Rudolf Wildenmann, uh, who need to be mentioned uh, if it comes to the joint sessions of workshops, and Erwin Scheuch, uh, uh, two young professors. And uh, they were both uh, instrumental in uh, building uh, the ECPR. And as an assistant at these days and times, you, know, you were involved in these, uh, uh, in these uh, kind of activities. And uh, I remember that uh, I think, Jean, you were the first 
guest in Cologne in, uh, when Ute and I uh, just started uh, to go comparative. And uh, as Ken said, uh, uh, I have uh, learned all what I needed to, to learn in terms of organizational skills, uh, uh, networks, uh, and uh, uh, other uh, uh, affairs uh, in uh, ECPR. And uh, I'm happy that uh, I was born into this kind of phase of uh, history. So we have been lucky. OK. Uh, yeah, I'm en, en route that way. I, I, I feel I should just say, in, in response to Daniele's legitimate question, but in, in, since IR was mentioned, one of the answers may be, it's, it, it's, uh, it is true that in the past, I don't think it's true if you look at the, uh, the last two to three years in terms of, of international relations presence in the mainstream of ECPR um, work, particularly workshops, because we have a different system of evaluating now, where actually IR is guaranteed a, a kind of quota, or at least that area. However, uh, that wasn't the point, I, uh, uh, point I'd make. One of the answers is, is if you look at the IR standing group. The IR standing group is the largest standing group in the ECPR structure. It has its own conferences, it has its own journal. Its numbers are simply huge. They, they dwarf all other standing groups. Um, and indeed, to the point where uh, there was this point in time where we were worried it was going to actually surpass ECPR in itself in size. So that may explain um, why it is that IR hasn't been quite so prominent in the mainstream of ECPR activity. Uh, Hans. Well, basically, my major worry uh, remains that professionalization very often means getting more specialized and more narrow and that somehow one wonders how much politics is, is still under, being understood by those who are, have to meet the high standards of the methodologists, uh, but may not have the knowledge uh, of the field that they're actually studying. And uh, I think the question of how one keeps enough in educational <coughs> programs, enough knowledge of the variety of politics and political systems, I think remains unanswered, and whether ECPR could actually do that or whether it just depends on the individual university curricula is another matter. Let me say, on the other hand, that working with people in the ECPR and certainly working with the people in the beginning that I was involved with has been one of the greater experiences of my life. Thank you. About uh, inclusion or exclusion. I remember some of the first workshops I attended, uh, John Sessions, there were also sessions in French, right? But that disappeared uh, quickly. Uh, and I think maybe we have a better chance now to really be inclusive because English is really being a language that everybody's more or less are speaking today, which was not the case uh, about 20 years ago. Um, uh, about, <laughs> well, politics being unpopular, uh, well, in my research, I, I, I do the whole world. I work on women's political representation and the use of gender quotas in the whole world. And there are lots of countries in the world who think democracy is extremely interesting and something worth striving for. So I think uh, we still have lots of things to do which are very meaningful at any rate. Uh, political science, uh, well, when I moved from Denmark to Sweden, I really have sensed the difference that in Sweden that you have much more status as a political scientist even if they're less educated than we were in Denmark. Um, they're only bachelors, all of them. Uh, but I, I, I mean, they have a higher status. There are lots of comments in the press for political scientists. That's why I say the, the risk of coming too close to political journalism, to political journalism is really something you have to, to consider. Uh, uh, to Jean Bondel about comparative analysis, I mean, you can only know one or two countries, I agree. Three may be really good, but you can make a research team where researchers come from different countries, uh, which is the way I work, and, and, and therefore you really have lots of people who know the country. Then, of course, you have to have a common language. I still remember the first book, a naughty book about women in naughty politics, and here were the Swedish people saying, women don't have any influence in Sweden. 
and especially women in the political parties don't have any influence. And the rest of us, for the four other countries, are saying, we thought the Swedish were the strongest. I mean, you have this strong social democratic women, right? Uh, so we have to, to realize that in Sweden you say women don't have influence and everything goes to hell. They don't really mean it, but that's the way they call it, right? So this is, I also think in order to know your own country, you have to have a comparative perspective, even if you only write about one country. Uh, and therefore I always think that comparative politics is such an extremely interesting uh, discipline, also if you only write about your own country. That is the only way you can really understand your own country. Thank you. John, would you like a last word? No, he, he passes, right. Okay, well, um, since we're talking about comparisons, uh, um, a couple of years ago we were, we were at Pisa and uh, this particular session, I think we ran over by half an hour to 40 minutes and the local organisers shrugged their shoulders. We started running over by about two minutes and the local organisers opened the door about five times in the last 10 minutes. So there, there's a comparison for you. Um, I... I uh, I uh, should like to, uh, yes, yeah, yeah. I should like to thank, uh, I think all of us would like to thank uh, the speakers for really a, a, a riveting set of uh, speeches. We were delighted to host them and please do now make your way to the reception immediately.